nation was seen as sacred, as full of soul, full of intelligence, full of purpose, full of meaning. For example, in, uh, in Hindu philosophy, forgive me because I, I don't know much about Hindu philosophy, so you, must, you know much more. But the idea is that consciousness is a primary attribute of the universe, and matter is a secondary attribute of the universe, which, which bubbles up from the primordial consciousness. In other words, everything is saturated with meaning, soul, and intelligence. Or to put it another way, the universe is much more like a mind or a soul than it is like a machine. Now in the West, we have deliberately repressed this view. And I think it's this repression of the understanding of the universe as sacred, alive, mysterious, full of intelligence, full of creativity, full of consciousness, full of sacredness, that has led up through nature. I think unless we recover the view of the earth as sacred, we will never solve the ecological crisis. Because we will always see the earth in terms of money, economics, uh, and we'll never get uh, a solution to these ecological crises. Can you, am I still there with you? Can you still hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes. Yeah, I just... Oh, there we go. Okay, so that's my radical suggestion to you. That, um... No... It's a... The question, the difficult thing now is how can we bring back this ancient worldview and combine it with the best economics, the best of our science, the best of our agriculture, so that we can create a new worldview. I'm not saying we should go back to a, an ancient worldview without science, without economics, without industry. That's obviously impossible. But we need to create new policies, new science, new economics that are informed by the ancient soulful understanding of the earth. So, um, in the West, at the time of Plato, the ancient Greeks, there was a name for this, this view, it was called the anima mundi, which means the soul of the earth. So I think we need to recover our anima mundi understanding of nature. Okay, let's have a little pause there and see what you think about that. That's a very radical idea. So let me... Give, give me some feedback, and then we'll move on to the third aspect of eco-literacy. I'm sorry if you can hear a big noise out there. I think there's a, a huge truck outside making a big noise. <laughs> anyway, uh, go ahead. Can you give me some feedback on what, what I've just been talking about? Does it make sense? Did you understand what I was trying to say, or did it not make sense? Don't be shy. Many people find this uh, approach quite shocking. It's not what they expect to hear. Um, you know, most people expect, yes, there's a man with his hand up. No, yes. Um, I'm from Cambodia. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, I am a participant from Cambodia. Uh, I have a question regarding with the, uh, I heard that the Western people uh, have the wrong understanding about nature. And can you elaborate more about that? Uh. Yes. I think that's what I was just trying to say. That In the West, we see nature as a dead machine. Right? It's just a dead machine, which we can understand only through rational scientific analysis. And because it's a dead machine, we can exploit it as we like, as much as we like. That's the basic problem. We have no respect for the earth. We just see it as a dead lump of resources. Minerals in the ground, forests to be cut down, and we just see it as a way of making money, really. That's all. That's the fundamental problem in the West. And unfortunately, this can't has happened because in the West we only think that Sorry, we think the only way of gaining reliable knowledge about something is through quantification, through measurement. Now, there are, but we now know that there are other ways of knowing. For example, intuitive knowing is very important. Intuition is very important. 
For example, in Asia, meditation is incredibly important. In Buddhism, in Hinduism, etc. In meditation, you can have a very strong intuitive insight that nature is full of intelligence. And that intuitive understanding, I think, is more important than the rational understanding, which makes you see nature as dead. The intuitive understanding makes you see nature as alive. And what we need to do to solve the ecological crisis is to put intuitive understanding and rational understanding together so they work in partnership. At the moment, we have only rational understanding and intuitive understanding is considered to be totally worthless and utter rubbish. That's the problem of the Western mind. That's the disease of the West, to, to have completely suppressed intuitive knowing. Now we need to bring intuitive knowing back and connect it with really good thinking and really good reasoning so that we can develop a science that will help take us out of the ecological crisis and economics that will take us out of the ecological crisis and agriculture that will take us out of the ecological crisis. But the most important thing is to develop deep respect for nature. So when you're writing your policy papers, or when you're talking for your Rio 20 conferences, I would suggest that you really start talking a lot about how we've lost the respect for nature and how in our policies we have to find ways of helping people to discover a deep intuitive sense of belonging to nature. This is absolutely central, of central importance. If we don't do this, we will continue to see the Earth as a dead machine and we'll continue to destroy nature. Now, I don't know if that answered your question. I've more or less repeated myself. Yes. Uh, so let me know. Is that okay? Did you, yes. did you get that? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Okay. So we're running out of time. So let's move on to a solution, some solutions. Unless anybody else wants to say something about the me mechanistic worldview versus the in intuitive worldview, anima mundi worldview. Anybody else want to say anything? Is anybody shocked to hear this? Is it, are you surprised that uh, I'm talking about this in this way? Um, maybe you were expecting some policy recommendations or something like that. You see, I think before we start even talking about policy, we have to go much deeper into psychology and spirituality um, to understand why we're so destructive in nature. Does anybody disagree with what I said? Yeah, sorry? What was that, the lady in the beautiful sari? Uh, sorry, sir. You what? <laughs> I, I think that I disagree. Um, for example, I, my house is a dead house. It's made from brick and wood and something. But because it's my house, so I have to protect it. It doesn't mean that because it's a dead house, so I don't care about it. So I think it's the same with the earth. It doesn't matter that the earth is dead or alive. That it, uh, if, you, if you are staying on the earth, so you have to keep it no matter what, it is dead or alive. So yes. I think I understand what you're saying, that you've got to look after your house, no matter how you regard it. You can still see it as a machine, but look after it. Is that your point? <coughs> yeah. 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 No, I, I, I think you're right, but I think it's a much stronger basis for looking after your house if you really love it and feel a deep connection with it and feel that when you walk into your house there's a sense of soul and meaning and purpose than if you just see your house as a kind of bunch of bricks that just dead you know if you walk into your house and you feel connection and spirituality and beauty then you're really going to have fantastic energy for protecting your house if you just see it as a bunch of bricks all separate that no real connection no real spirituality then your house is, you'll protect it out of selfish reasons but you won't have deep satisfaction a deep sense of belonging and we need to recover this deep sense of belonging to the earth now just to finish the we can move on to the third aspect of eco-literacy, solutions. The question then is, how can we develop this sense of belonging? And here, I think what we can do is combine the very best of Western science with the very best, if you like, of Eastern understanding of nature, which is nature as a great consciousness. And a good example of how we can do this is with the Gaia theory. 
Now, how many people have heard of the Gaia theory from James Lovelock? You just put up your hands. Have you heard of Gaia theory from James Lovelock? No, I disagree. Okay. I disagree yeah? with the point that the Earth is dead. You, you, you disagree with the point that the Earth is dead? Because you know, That's the good. Earth is sustainable by nature, and it is inbuilt. And it's a balance, and it has got mountains, rivers, forests, just to maintain this balance. And if we disturb this equilibrium by deforestation or by cutting mountains, we'll make it unstable, and that's what we all are doing. So, Earth is in any case, it's not dead. It's alive. No, well, good. I'm glad you agree. Um, but you see, whenever we are at conferences, uh, big conferences like Rio, in the main meetings, we're always talk using very mechanistic language, you know, um, purely rational scientific language. And I think that's very important, but we're, we're frightened to use more intuitive, poetic language about the Earth. And I think we have to combine the two. Now, in the Gaia theory, of James Lovelock, a great British scientist who has taught at Schumacher College several times, we have an opportunity of combining the best science with this more intuitive connection with nature. So Gaia is G-A-I-A, -A, Gaia theory. Um, so if you'll allow me, I'll just say a little bit about that, and then we're probably running to the end of our time, and we can have a final discussion. So Gaia is the ancient Greek divinity of the earth. But Lovelock used the name Gaia for a scientific theory of the earth. And the proposal is like this. He says, the earth has two components. One is the sum of all living beings, the biota, all the biologically alive entities, the plants, the animals, the bacteria, the fungi, and the others, the protoptista. Um, and then on the other hand, we have the non-living, so-called non-living aspect, the rocks, the atmosphere, and the water. And these two are combined through very tight interactions. And when they interact with each other, something unexpected happens. And that is that the whole planet uh, is able to regulate its surface conditions over thousands of millions of years within the narrow limits that life can tolerate. So that's the Gaia theory, the idea that when organisms begin to interact with rocks, atmosphere, and water, we get an emergent property that arises from that interaction, which is that the Earth becomes a self-regulating being. <clears throat> now, this is a scientific way of saying that the Earth is alive. So with Lovelock's Gaia theory, we have a modern scientific expression of the ancient idea that the earth is alive. Only this modern expression is, comes out purely in the language of science. So I think Gaia theory is incredibly important for understanding the, what's happening on the planet. And I think what we can do, maybe when, what you could suggest at your Rio 20 conferences, or when you're writing your policy papers, is that we need to develop educational methods for teaching as many people as possible about the Gaian understanding of the Earth. We need to teach economists. They are, I have to say, I don't want to use, I don't want to be rude to economists, economists, but mainstream economists are the most ignorant people when it comes to ecology. They're the ones who really need to understand Gaia and ecology. We need to educate scientists, economists, agriculturalists, everybody on the planet needs to have a sense of Gaia as a great living being that we are all inside of. Otherwise, none of our efforts to solve climate change are going to work because we'll have the wrong world view. And so ultimately, I think we'll fail. OK, so that's probably enough, because I think Tech said we had about 25 minutes or so. So now, over